When the Civil War broke out in the spring of 1861, over 1.5 million Irish immigrants were living in the North. While many hoped for nothing more than to be accepted as part of their adopted homeland, there were nevertheless a group of men who sought to use their time in the United States for one purpose, organizing an Irish-American army to overthrow British rule in Ireland. This is Ryan, and welcome to Footnoting History. The Irish harvest of 1845 was a good one, or so it seemed. Though for us today it would have been rather depressing, for it mostly consisted of potatoes. An average Irishman ate between 12 to 15 pounds of potatoes a year during the 1840s and relied upon this crop for nearly all their sustenance. All seemed normal for the crop, at least to most observers. Little did these Irish farmers know that their lives would be upended in a matter of weeks. You can imagine how it began. A young child woken in the early morning to take care of the daily chores, to the bins they go planning to feed the family's livestock with a few potatoes. Opening the bins, they find the crop. All of the crop had rotted, changing from healthy white potatoes to black rotten mush nearly overnight. Suddenly, screams filled the air as neighbors stumbled upon the same situation. Eight million Irish lived in Ireland in 1845, and most relied on the potato. Watching their crop rot before their very eyes, many could only have guessed how horrible the situation would become. Over the next five years, as crop after crop succumbed to the potato blight, a fungus carried to Europe from the Americas that thrived in the damp Irish environment, the situation became increasingly worse, especially as the English did nothing to help their Irish citizens. As nationalist John Mitchell noted, God brought the blight, but England brought the famine. As many as two million people died and another two million fled Ireland, nearly half of the total population. Most of these immigrants ended up in North America, where they were bound together by a shared memory of exile and anger. Anger that the once great Irish nation had suffered so badly, and anger over English misrule. Many of these exiled Irishmen, huddled together in the cramped and dirty inner cities of the North, desperately hoped to strike a blow for their country in any way they could. Into the breach came the Fenians, a group that gave these men hope and offered them a chance to enact change. Who were the Fenians, and how serious an organization were they? This is something that historians have debated for years, and something that no one has yet come to any sort of real consensus on. Inevitably, when we look at the Irish experience in the Civil War, we can't talk about it without discussing the Fenians, for they were very active in the organization of Irish regiments uh, and very proud conveyors of Irish heritage. Many officers were loosely affiliated with this organization, and the group pops up time and time again when we look at the experiences of Irish regiments at war. Within the broader context of Irish history, both here in America and in Ireland, Fenianism has become more of an all-encompassing term. By the turn of the 20th century, the English used Fenians or Fenianism to refer to any Irishman who they perceived to be involved in revolutionary activities. And the Irish themselves took on this term. Fenian became a blanket reference to anyone involved in the national independence movement. And for these men, for these freedom fighters, it created a strong link to past revolutionaries. And as the IRA fought the English for their independence, they could justify their acts as part of a rich heritage that was preserved in literature, song, and political jargon. The history of Irish republicanism is, in fact, long and complex. But the Fenians themselves represented an evolution of 19th century revolutionary activity that dates back to the 1798 revolution of Wolf Tone's United Irishmen and Robert Emmett's abortive 1803 uprising, and then, at the height of the famine, the failed uprising of the United Irishmen in 1848, an uprising that was put down in part by the English and in part by the Catholic Church. The nationalist movement that emerged in the 1850s was part of a transatlantic movement with members in both Ireland and the United States cooperating in hopes of achieving the goal of Irish independence. This makes it truly unique and something that uh, is really very important within the history uh, of, of Ireland and Irish independence. Well, past revolutionaries had hoped to garner support of immigrants in the United States. The Fenians were different, for they sought to utilize the liberties guaranteed by the American Constitution to openly train volunteers for revolution in, in Ireland. Irish nationalists hoped to not only organize these men in America, but to arm them, train them, and then put them on ships to transport them back to Ireland. These were all things that were denied to the Irish at home, for they were not allowed to own firearms, and any Irish organization was looked upon by the British with suspicion. In the late 1880s, an aged, bearded man took pen to paper in a small apartment in Paris. 
His name was James Stevens, and this was the second time that the founder of the Fenian movement found himself exiled to the French capital. The first was nearly 30 years earlier when, as a member of Young Ireland, he had eluded English capture and made his way to the continent where he worked as a tutor and cultivated a new nationalist ideology. Part of the problem with the Young Ireland movement, he believed, was that it didn't appeal to the people, and he hoped to organize a new organization that met the needs of a struggling Irish nation. Twenty-five years ago, he wrote, there was no such word as Fenianism. It was John O'Mahony, another member of Young Ireland, and the man responsible for translating Keating's History of Ireland to English, who first used the term to refer to the new organization that the men began to develop in the early 1850s. The Fenians were ancient defenders of Ireland, and by using this name, Stevens and O'Mahony sought to give credibility to their movement, linking it firmly to the heroic militia and the tradition of Irish independence and military might. Fenianism, these men determined, would be symbolized by two principles. First, that Ireland had a natural right to independence, and secondly, that that right could be won by armed revolution. In 1856, Stevens returned to Ireland, where he made an effort to gauge the national consciousness of the people. With the hope of renewing the struggle for independence, Stevens claimed he found the country politically dead, with peace reigning from Antrim to Cape Fear and from Connemara to Dublin. Dismayed at this sham of forced peace, Stevens lamented the willingness of the Irish to accept English rule without a murmur of remorse. Ten years later, however, the Fenian chief claimed upwards of 200,000 in the Fenian movement, a major success if his numbers are to be believed. A key part of his organization would involve unifying the Irish-American diaspora, and beginning in 1858, John O'Mahony, who had set up shop in Brooklyn, New York, began to organize and consolidate the disparate Irish militia and social groups that had developed as insular protections against nativism at mid-century. Stevens relied heavily on O'Mahony, who he believed to be, quote, far and away the first patriot of the Irish race. I speak of him, Stevens wrote, now as I know him for years of trying intimacy, and his residence in Brooklyn, in spite of all of it, has only developed, intensified, and brought into brighter relief the faith not only in the justice of the Irish cause, but in the manhood and power of the people to make it triumph. Key to O'Mahony's early efforts in unifying the dispersed Irish elements throughout the United States at the time was the publication of a weekly newspaper in Brooklyn he called The Phoenix, a reference to the rebirth of the Irish nationalist cause. A radical journal touting an Irish agenda, The Phoenix, O'Mahony wrote, shall be studied to have it so arranged that everything it contains shall be subordinate to one principle of which it is exponent. Due prominence will be given to whatever tends to prove the courage of the Irish people is yet high and their spirit unbroken, that they are now as tenacious of their nationality as at any time within the keen of history. Despite their nationalist agenda, the Fenians actively acknowledged and supported the United States for the success of the Republican experience that was so foreign to their fellow countrymen they believed was necessary to enact change in Ireland. These men, despite their nationalist leanings, were active participants in social, political, military, and economic spheres of life in the United States. But their participation was conditional on the relationship between those activities and the eventual liberation of Ireland. All Irish Republicans, O'Mahony wrote, have a direct interest in respecting the authority of the American government. But failure to remain neutral in regards to American politics, he claimed, will endanger the success and grand experiment of self-government in Ireland. So these were conditional Americans who sought to use the United States, but kept Ireland first and foremost in their thoughts, their hearts, and their minds. Go where you will in America, O'Mahony wrote in December of 1859, and you will meet among Irishmen but one sentiment, the liberation of Ireland. Irishmen, O'Mahony continued, have no right to be setting themselves up as the champions of any other nation so long as a miserable foreign garrison and a handful of traitors are permitted to rob and oppress them in their own country. Ireland, in desperate need of salvation, had nowhere else to turn save her own masses abroad. By dying for Ireland, a Fenian newspaper in Dublin wrote, each falling generation bequeaths to its successor the same sacred cause and heroic spirit, and the fresh generation does battle for the hollow trust with the souls of men who nobly love their land. This was not simply banter, 
for the Fenians were actively organizing throughout the United States in the years before the war. Organization that was seen by some within American society as threatening, for they did not know where the loyalty of these adopted citizens truly lay. By 1860, there were Irish militia units in nearly every major northern city that had pledged their allegiance to John O'Mahony and the Fenians. And when the Civil War broke out in 1861, many of these men uh, volunteered to defend their union. And their service, sadly, appears to have come at the expense of the Irish national question. In our story here, two units from New Haven, Connecticut are of particular interest. The Emmett Guards and McGowan Guards, named for the famous nationalists and United Irishmen Robert Emmett and Patrick McGowan, had organized in 1858 in the capital city of Connecticut. Interestingly, their organization came in the wake of a nativist crusade in the 1850s to disperse ethnic militia units, who they saw as threatening to peace and stability at home. When the Civil War broke out, some 16 members of these two units began organizing a regiment to fight for the Union. Finally mustered into service in November of 1861, the 9th Connecticut was sent as the state's only Irish regiment and fought gallantly throughout the war. They were involved in the occupation of New Orleans, fought at the Battle of Pass Christian, where they became the first Union regiment to capture Confederate battle flag, and then again at Baton Rouge, where they routed Confederate forces under General John Breckinridge. They were at Vicksburg in the summer of 1862, a year before that city fell to Union forces under Ulysses S. Grant, and in 1864 they were transferred to the Shenandoah Valley, where they fought under General Philip Sheridan during his campaign against Jubal Early's Confederates, a campaign that was vital to Union victory in 1865. Among these Fenians was Lawrence O'Brien, a 22-year-old Mason from New Haven who was commissioned as First Lieutenant of Company B in September of 1861. The full company, when finally mustered into service, composed 96 men who were predominantly unskilled laborers from New Haven. Many of them were of Irish birth. Close friends with the regiment's colonel and fellow Fenian Thomas Cahill, O'Brien was a young, idealistic officer when he marched to war in November of 1861. His time was spent in the South, leading men and playing an active role in regimental politics. He was fairly silent on the Irish nationalist question, at least for the first two years of his service. But in the autumn of 1863, O'Brien received a letter from his uncle, John Alice O'Brien. John's letter is interesting because it helps us better understand his nephew's involvement with the Fenians and gives some insight into the Irish perspective on the nationalist question. John segues from a discussion of monetary problems and a comment on his nephew's photograph, which he had received in the mail, to a discussion of the national question. Concerning Lawrence's photograph, he writes, I don't think I flatter myself when I say a nicer cut of soldier is not in Her Majesty's service, from Prince George of Cambridge to the humblest private. I may see the day that I can see the original. This desire to see his nephew in person is presumably a response to a previous letter in which Lawrence had noted his intentions to return to his homeland. But this comment on the picture also came with words of caution. The nationalist question in Ireland, John implied, is in peril and exaggerated in the eyes of Irish immigrants who see tangible results of their open organization in the United States. John continued his letter, noting that there is not half the stress laid upon the issue of nationalism that you think there is. No other part of Ireland, only Tipperary, taking any part in the meetings. As for your thinking to come to Ireland with the remnant of the Irish-American army, put it out of your head and all of that hot-headed young Irishman of your acquaintance. I know Ireland east, west, north, and south as well and better than any of those people who are always speeching. My heart bleeds when I read some of their speeches, knowing that they are not able to compass what they surely attempt. Better, he continued, that American Irish, assisted by their countrymen at home, by biding their time and never attempting until England is engaged otherwise, free their country. But if they foolishly attempt it otherwise, they will make another 98 of it, a reference to the failed United, United Irish uprising of 1798. O'Brien's message is not one of inevitable failure, but only of the necessity for Irish Americans to proceed with caution. His letter suggests above all else that the views of the Fenians in the United States were more radical than those of nationalists in Ireland and their efforts at organization had advanced at a much faster pace abroad. His letter, though, did little to curb Lawrence's commitment to the nationalist cause. Discharged from the United States military at the expiration of his term on October 26th of 1864, O'Brien quickly transitioned from federal service to Fenian service when he assumed the position of head center of the Fenian Brotherhood in the state of Connecticut. 
He was, in essence, in charge of all Fenian efforts in the state of Connecticut during that period. During this time, he was also in direct correspondence with John O'Mahony, who wrote to him in August stating that, quote, the fight for freedom will begin in Ireland as soon as the harvest is gathered, and that all officers of military skill and ability who are expected to help in the fight should be in Ireland before the rising. Organizing officers from his district, the Connecticut men reported to O'Mahony in New York, where O'Brien was given a thousand sovereigns in gold and a second bill in exchange for 1,500 pounds. It was money collected to finance the pending uprising in Ireland, and O'Brien was charged with delivering it back to his homeland. When O'Brien arrived in Ireland in 1866, he found a very disjointed and disconnected nationalist movement. Tensions between James Stevens and the Irish Americans had grown over the course of the Civil War and finally reached a head in 1865 when Thomas Kelly, a former captain in the Army of the Cumberland, arrived in Ireland to, it seems, provide a clearer picture for those Irish Americans as to what Stevens had accomplished during the Civil War. Stevens at first was delighted to hear of Kelly's arrival. He believed that Kelly was to be the first group of experienced officers sent to form a signal corps and to train Irish soldiers. However, Upon learning the true intent of Kelly's mission, that of determining Stevens's leadership ability, he became angry and wrote to the Irish Americans asking if they questioned his leadership. When O'Brien arrived in 1866, he was part of this transition of, of power from the Irish to the Americans. And his memoirs, which relate sp specifically to his operations under James Kelly, point to a growing Irish American control over Republican operations in that country. This American leadership proposed an increasingly radical agenda, which called for revolution despite warnings from their Irish counterparts to the adverse political climate throughout the island. As he moved around the country, attempting to organize circles of Fenian radicals, O'Brien was detained by British authorities in January of 1867 in Cashel, where he had met with another veteran, Thomas Francis Burke, in preparation to join with Irish Republican Brotherhood forces in Waterford as they made their way north. Miscommunication and a, the sudden illness of another compatriot, Major John Delahanty, caused the group to split, and O'Brien was subsequently arrested, making his way to Cashel. As he remembered, he was brought before one of the most cold-blooded scoundrels I ever saw, and was committed to jail for being a stranger. During this time, he was brought four times before the grand jury, and on the fourth time, after the arrival of an arrest warrant from the Lord Lieutenant, he was determined guilty of treason and escorted in irons and by armed police to Clonmel Jail. There he was confined with 15 other Fenian prisoners. He later attributed his arrest to the deceitful and lying scoundrels who comprise the Britishers in Ireland and the tactics by which they hold this country. Six months after his original incarceration, O'Brien was finally charged with high treason against Her Most Gracious Majesty and his separate charge of treason felony. He claims in his memoirs that British authorities doctored charges against him and witnesses were coerced into identifying him as part of a conspiracy to overthrow the British government. He was, ironically, involved in all of those activities, but his memoirs make it very clear that as an Irish nationalist, he didn't see this in those terms. He did not see his service as treasonous, but rather his services was what was expected as a true Irishman. According to his memoirs, he escaped from jail after convincing a sympathetic prison guard to aid him in his efforts. More recent information suggests that he, in fact, negotiated his release and was released on bail. Nevertheless, his story, the heroic jailbreak, became part of his own myth and he returned home to play a prominent role in the New Haven and Irish-American community there. Ultimately, Lawrence O'Brien was part of a failed movement that did not actually achieve the physical goal of a free Irish nation as, as envisioned by the original founders. Uh, in fact, many historians have seen Fenian military action, especially their invasion of Canada in the late 1860s, as, as uh, fairly amusing that these Irish Americans believed that they could invade a foreign nation and trade Canada for Irish independence. As one historian put it, Irish action in the post-Civil War era was near comic opera bungling and quick, futile, and embarrassing. Nevertheless, the failure of uprising in Ireland and the failure of military action in Canada does not negate or diminish the actions of these Union and Confederate soldiers in pursuit of this imagined Irish Republic, nor does it show the inability to physically transport any Irish-American army to Ireland in the immediate aftermath of the war. 
Rather, if we understand O'Brien as part of this very vibrant Fenian community, we see how radical these Irish Americans were and how truly dedicated they were to achieving Irish independence. Men such as Lawrence O'Brien were willing to sacrifice their lives for this goal of Irish independence. And although Fenianism is incredibly complex and often unclear and at the time unsuccessful, the efforts of men such as James Stevens, John O'Mahony, and Lawrence O'Brien laid an important foundation for the future success of independence in that island nation. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week.